Scripture this morning is Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 35. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which have been prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. A sword will pierce your own soul too. Let me make a couple of announcements. First of all, to introduce our special guest that we have with us today. I was uh, pleased that uh, for Dwayne Unruh to be able to be with us, he, he did not come to Enid America to be with us. He came to be with his dad who had, had uh, came down with COVID here a while back. But uh, Dwayne and his wife Penny and their children are one of the families that we've been praying for for years and years and years. They serve as God's servants in Belgium, and uh, so we support them in our terms of our world missions. And I'm grateful to have them here today. He'll be sharing with us in just a few moments. Uh, let me mention another item. Don't let me forget Dwayne Unruh. Uh, when we get through this morning, you've got candy for us, don't you? He's got that good chocolate candy, so don't everybody rush out until Dwayne's got an opportunity to hand out our, our, our sacks for us and uh, keep that in mind. Seems like there's something else I'm supposed to say, and I can't remember what it is. My granddaughter, Haley, is going to sing for us just now. Okay.
Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to come and share today. I'll get my screen going in the right direction for my text. I thought I would um, take the opportunity to answer three questions this morning. One is, who are you and why are you in Belgium? Uh, what about the COVID-19 situation in Belgium? And then look at a text that we read and we titled it, Christmas Mundane, Messy, or Marvelous? So first, I guess I need this. Just to get acquainted a little bit and to refresh our minds, this is who we are. This is my wife and I, were, we've been in Belgium for 21 years. Um, our youngest son and his fiance now, they um, are studying at the theological school there, um, together with us at our home here. And the, uh, our middle son, helping us lay some brick, some tile, which is pretty much what everybody in Belgium grows up doing. Uh, everything is brick and block, along with a couple of colleagues there, you see. So this is where we are in the middle of Europe. And uh, we live there in the, um, in the Flanders, the Dutch-speaking northern half of the country. Uh, of course, our neighbors are the Netherlands, Germany, Luxembourg, France, and uh, uh, Great Britain across the water. You might uh, think of Belgium materially as a first world country, like much of the Western world, but it's good to think of it as a, spiritually a third world country because of the scarcity of gospel uh, teaching, gospel models, gospel information. And like Matthew tells us, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? To get the priorities, I know it's not in the news much about the spiritual need, uh, where the physical and, and needs are often spoken about, but we try to think about Western Europe differently in this sense. And so we've gotten to be involved in several things. Here's my wife being a little bit animated at the moment for uh, the past four years we've lived at what we call connect the retreat center where people come to refresh and reflect and review uh, the priorities in life it's the first of its kind um, this is a, a new thing for our country and here's some of the our colleagues there we have seven studio apartments and then a group room as well, a group, uh, look, a group yeah, meeting room uh, for refreshment and equipping the saints for ministry. We also get to work with young leaders. This young man on the right uh, actually came to faith during a basketball camp in our country about 15 years ago and has grown to where he is the leader now of the sport ministry in, in Belgium uh, called Sport Quest. It's fun to see. The couple in the gray sweatshirts or sweater here is also a younger couple who have come to start coordinating ministries to Muslim background people. And so this is, a, of course, a big issue socially in our country in our part of the world and perhaps here as well but we've had the chance to help support them and help them organize they've started a, a ministry called Mahaba you saw that strange name it's just the Arabic word for love and so they have uh, helping us look to how Jesus would look at our Muslim neighbors and then we uh, get to be involved with refugees as well mobilizing Christians to come alongside refugees in their darkest, uh, most difficult moment of their life, and to give them direction both to God and to practical situations. We have a new team member coming. Her name is Leslie from all the way back into Kansas uh, to Wichita, and she's uh, getting close to halfway of her support, and she hopes to get uh, to join us next summer, next fall. Um, so yeah, she was uh, working for a couple of years with SportQuest, for example, and then uh, now coming on full-time with our mission. 
Okay, what's COVID-19 like in Belgium? Well, pretty much the same as here in many ways. This is uh, us back in March and April when we first made the masks and uh, started locking down. Uh, all four of us um, got COVID at that time and were sick for a month or so. And so um, it was not an easy time for us and how we had it, but uh, it's allowed us to now to travel and to be more helpful, perhaps. Our team meetings are over Zoom and uh, Skype and that kind of thing, like, uh, like the, some of them are probably are here. We don't have church services for the last, uh, we had church services live between July and October, and then the rest have been uh, online. So right now, this is the first church service I've been at uh, for uh, the last three months, I guess, or two and a half. And then uh, God was, gave us foresight uh, or the opportunity to start a seeker Bible study in September online. And thankfully so, uh, we had, were about 20, 25 people that uh, got together, mostly were f from the church in order to now in January split up into two or three groups and to uh, actually have include our neighbors and friends and family that don't know the Lord. So this was more of a training uh, study of going through it ourselves, but uh, there you see us, some of us online. Okay. Christmas, mundane or marvelous. Uh, for some of us, I'm just guessing the messy part could be a part of it as well. What is Christmas like for us? I th the uh, text that we read uh, this morning has the key verse, verse 33, and Joseph and his mother, I suppose I need that, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of Jesus. Why did they marvel? Well, the, the verses, the four verses prior give us clues into why they marveled. I suppose when thinking back about, there, there's all kinds of circumstances when I think about Christmas, just a few days away now this year, maybe it's, we've had 80 Christmases in a row and it's nothing special, just the way it is. Maybe it's, for some people, I remember that it's a painful time because that's when a loved one has passed away. That's when something bad happened in the family. The Hallmark movie will often show someone who had, had a tragedy at Christmas, and so for them it's hard to get over the situation. And for others, it can be a very special time because of all the festivities going on. But this is Joseph and Mary now marveling at what was spoken of this baby. They knew there was promises given, but what is it specifically that they were marveling at? Can I just say a side note? This Christmas moment seems to me to be one of two most unique moments in history. The other one would be the crucifixion of Jesus, right? And why would they be so unique? And I think it's because of what a colleague wrote recently. Uh, his name is Pete, and he wrote in a comment about a Bible study, Lord Jesus, this is the sign by which we will ne ever recognize you on this earth when we search for your presence. It's the sign of humility. Who on earth would look in a stable and kneel down by a manger to find the Son of God? Unique moments in history, this may be one of the two most unique. The God of the universe would actually come in this form and this way, in this form of humility. That must say something about his character and about who he is. And that's what I find so special about this text because like any text in the Bible, if you look at it and you say, well, what, um, what do I get out of this text? How do I study this text? Uh, one simple question to ask yourself is, well, what does it say about God? And so we look at this text and uh, starting with uh, the quote. We'll just deal with the quote here. 
Uh, Luke chapter 2 and starting with verse 29, the quote of Simeon. Simeon was um, like a prophet of the Old Testament. The Spirit of God was on him. Here, just a bit later, we see Anna the prophetess. Well, Simeon was probably like a, a prophet anyway. Don't know his title, but he was a godly, uh, God-fearing man with the Spirit of God on him. And he gives these few simple lines which have a dramatic effect and, and tell us why Mary and Joseph marveled. And that's because the first word is Lord and the rest of it's going to tell us what kind of Lord this is. And you might ask yourself, so what kind of Lord do I serve? What kind of Lord would come at Christmas time? Who is he exactly? What is his character? What can I know about him? So we just look in these verses and you see underlined, if you can see that far in the small print, the uh, underlined portions, five times it says you or your. These are things that come out of this Lord or this Lord, his characteristics of this Lord. Let's look at them briefly. He, Simeon, took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God and said. And a side note, you take Jesus in your arms, you confronted with Jesus, something's going to happen. There's going to be a reaction. You're going to begin to praise God for his wonder and his character. Or you're going to be fearful. You're going to want to reject. You're going to say, oh, he's going to take control of my life. I don't want that. There's going to be a reaction of some sort, and we're going to see that at the end. Now Simeon took him up in his arms, and he said, Lord, what kind of Lord are you? Now says, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. The simple words, you are peace. This Lord is the Lord of peace. First, very simple things, perhaps the day-to-day -day kind of peace, like about Wednesday, I was reading in the scripture my quiet time, devotional time, and I was really struck by particular ideas and, and words, and they were refreshing to me, and I was able to put thoughts into words. And the next day, a pastor called and said, well, do you want to speak on Sunday? And I'm one, when I preach now, one-on-one -on -one or small group uh, things fit me easily and uh, but when I preach I usually have months of preparation but you know there was this this calm because I just the day before had some thoughts that I thought you know God is just preparing he gives peace in the small circumstances of life but also in the large ones here Simeon says your servant uh, depart in peace. He's speaking of death, the end of life. And we might think of Psalm 23 in this setting, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. That God gives peace in the most dramatic situations as well because of who he is. Now, Lord, what else in your character besides being one who provides peace or shalom, a completeness, a health, what would it be? Lord, the second part of the verse there, according to your word. Now, if I gave you a promise, you would say, hmm, I don't know if I know Dwayne well enough to know what he means by that promise, what he says. I don't know if Dwayne is capable of following through because my words uh, only are as good as depends upon me and though I will have best in intentions probably maybe tainted a little bit with selfishness um, I will try to follow th follow through but I am not sovereign nor big enough to make other things and all the circumstances fit together and that's what this word is about Lord your according to your word these things are happening which simply means God has a word and we have it in the scriptures, that has promises in them, and he is uniquely capable of making them come to pass. So we look at Christmas, and we look at verse 30, and we say, Lord, thank you. You are faithful to your word. You provide peace, but not only that, verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And this would be the key, the central thought, 
in Simeon's prayer, his blessing of this child, for my eyes have seen your salvation. The Lord, again, what is his character? He provides salvation. I looked uh, briefly, if you Google the 10 biggest needs or the biggest needs of this world, you'll find uh, quickly a number of lists, right? You'll find things like poverty and war, clean water. Uh, I looked uh, and saw that the United Nations has a list of 22 greatest needs of the world that they invest themselves in, and they're one unique global body that tries to think through these things, and they listed other items, but also human rights and climate change. And then I saw that there's a list of countries with the most needy people. In other words, the most people in that country with the greatest needs. And on the, for the top of those lists, you know, countries like Yemen was number one, the Democratic Republic of Congo was number two, then Syria, Nigeria. And of course, they were speaking specifically toward what we typically think of, material needs, social needs, um, survival needs, right? But here Jesus is named as the one to bring salvation. And it's the greatest need. And what is that? It's just a spiritual salvation with a promise of complete and eternal salvation in every way that's coming. This salvation was in Jesus, very specifically. This baby, this child, was the Savior. And he himself was the greatest gift. No other Messiah, no other salvation uh, could offer salvation or forgiveness or reconciliation with God. This Jesus, specifically, was that gift. It was... Not so many years ago, but I remember where I was when I first connected the dots. A pastor was speaking, as he always did on Sunday, about how the gospel of Jesus Christ and he died for our sins. And, and then he made the connection of this salvation is the only thing that solves our condition of pride. And for the first time in my life, that clicked this Jesus solves the basic issue inside of us and is the only one that can do that, this issue of pride. Because there's not one thing I can add to the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. I can't do anything to, to finish his work. What can I do? Well, yes, he calls me when, it, when he calls me to salvation. He calls me, and I have, a, I have a calling. I have a job to do. I have gifts and a faithfulness to work out as a servant of Jesus Christ. But that has to do with rewards. It has to do with faithfulness. Even after I've been a believer for now, what, 50 years or so, I can't increase my status with God. I can't increase my status with you or anybody else either. The greatest title I will always carry is a sinner saved by grace. And this simple message, because Jesus has done it all from start to finish, is what resolves and takes away, cleanses all hints of pride like nothing else in the world because we so much want to prove ourselves. We so much want to add something to what God has done. This great salvation. You'll know that um, in the Northern Hemisphere, we have a Northern Star, uh, a North Star. The Big Dipper, of course, uh, we learn has the handle and has the, uh, the four stars around and the, the, the N2, as if, if you follow them as it pours out, it, and then what is it, four or five lengths uh, of the, uh, the dipper, you'll find them pouring out and that's the North Star. And for seafaring 
sailors and, and many others, uh, we do wilderness travel. The North Star gives a bearing point, right? Well, I learned recently about the Southern Cross. Evidently in the Southern Hemisphere, you that have traveled more than I have, uh, there's the same thing, but they can't see the North Star. They see the Southern Cross, where the bottom part of the cross points also to a fixed star that always shows them where they are in the world. And that these stars in the different parts of the world would be like Jesus here, that he is always the center. Now that's very conf confrontational, controversial, but he is always center wherever we are in the world to God's plan and God's salvation. Well, the last phrases here also tell us about this Lord. Verse 31, he says, Now, Lord, you're letting your servant depart in peace, and for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And the first you there is which you have prepared. Perhaps there's some of us that like to blame God yet because God just doesn't come to us like we expect him to. He doesn't fulfill the things that we want and long for. He doesn't fit our expectations. And so he tends to be the scapegoat. It's easy to blame him because he takes it. But here he says, this Lord, the Lord God, is one who prepares. He plans, he puts things in all the pieces together. And we like to do puzzles at mom and dad's house. Huh? And it's really God putting all those puzzle pieces together. From long ages ago till right now, he prepares these things to fit just as they need to in order to be before the face of all peoples, that every person can see, understand, and be confronted with this child who brings salvation. Not only the Jews, he's the glory of the Jews, but also the Gentiles, so all non-Jews, he's their light that shines the warmth and the clarity in our life. Jesus himself does this. And God has prepared this for all people. And the last you or your is there, you see at the very end, your people Israel. Now Israel, of course, was the most privileged of people groups since their existence. Not because of anything they did, and that was made very clear. Not because of anything they were, but because God had chosen them as his dwelling place and as his servants. But here in the verses right after, Simeon says a couple more things. Have you seen that? It's not on the screen, but if you see, I'll read it for you. Then Simeon blessed Mary and Joseph and the child and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And I can't help but wonder here when he says, your people Israel is so like your people. They're chosen. They have nothing special within them, but God chooses them. God chooses us to come close to us. But the person of Jesus Christ will do one or two things. He will cause us to rise because of belief in him, surrender to him, and rise to eternal life. Or he will cause us to fall. And there is judgment. And he will cause us to say, no, I don't want. I, I don't believe. I want to resist your call. And uh, we end up with destruction. There is this in, it wasn't just a, oh, a happy, fuzzy, soft Christmas story in that sense. The love letter of God's word is a love letter because it can get down into the nitty-gritty and the real 
and the exacting and really deal with our lives the way they need to be dealt with. And this is one of the, the reasons or one of the ways that Jesus would provide either the rise or the fall. And there is heartache and there is rejoicing in that, depending on. Now, this is for us too. We are privileged. If we hear the word of God, if we have met this son of God, and if we have realized that the Lord that we're dealing with is able to bring peace in personal circumstances and in great world situations. If his word is faithful, his promises are true, and we can take on today, good for now and for eternity. If he provides a salvation that cares for the, the basic need, and in fact, this salvation can go with into Nigeria, into Yemen, and to Syria, and it doesn't necessarily solve all the material issues, but it provides a salvation and a freedom amongst uh, of amidst the situation and the circumstances that are there. This great salvation. But this Lord is also prepared. He puts the puzzle pieces together and he chooses people. And now it's just the reaction. You know, Lord God, what do I do Christmas Eve, Christmas Day? How do I respond to you? Do I say, thank you, Lord? I have never met a Lord like this before. I rejoice in you. I praise you. I surrender to you. I put my trust in you. Or do we say, you know what? I find other things more important. I'd rather try other things. I really can't give up my own wish for pulling myself up by my own bootstraps and adding to uh, this religion thing. Um, I want to do it. I want to pray with you now, if you would allow me to. We pray that God would have his way with us, that we would find Christmas not mundane, not messy even either, but marvelous as Mary and Joseph did. Let's pray. To your Heavenly Father, we come to you because your word speaks of you as marvelous. Father God, you are searching our hearts, you know us, and I pray now that you would show us who we are, what your plans are for our lives, and that we would respond in joy and marvel, that we would wonder in astonishment at such great and grand things that you have done and that you are doing now today through your promises that are just as effective now and just as uh, useful and promising as they ever were. And Father God, in this simple message and simple time, we lay our hearts before you and ask, may we believe in you, may we trust you, may we find our greatest joy of the year in you, our Lord and Jesus. Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Christ, we'll have something special for you if you want to get engaged on the first time. Dwayne, where are you?